greatest form of control is where you think you're free when you're being fundamentally manipulated and dictated. One form of dictatorship is being in a prison cell and you can see the bars and touch it. The other one is sitting in a prison cell but you can't see the bars and you think you're free. free. What the human race is suffering from is mass hypnosis. We are being hypnotized by people like this. News readers, politicians, teachers, lecturers. We are in a country and in a world that is being run by unbelievably sick people. The chasm between what we're told is going on and what is really going on is absolutely enormous. Yes, hello. I, I know it's been a while, guys, but yes, you are, in fact, watching another episode of the Red Pill Hardcore TV show. And I've been very, very busy with other projects. You guys have seen the new TV network. Hopefully you're watching it from our YouTube channel right now. Yes, targeted family case files. And more is coming. More is coming. Just got to actually get the right agreements with everybody. We got, we got to bring on more hosts. I'm sick of actually doing this all the time. I wish I could just replace myself. I'm going to try to replace myself across the board so you guys can see <laughs> new, fresh faces on these shows that don't have me on it. Okay, anyways, for this episode, I have a very wonderful activist, Fanny Rice activist, who has been doing a lot of you know, well, there, there's activism, and then there is rallying. There's there's collecting. There's 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 there's. I mean, there's so much more to. It makes it they're activists. They you know they put up posts, or they they talk about something. You know, they throw paint on a fur. You know, it, there's all kinds of people that can say that they're activists, but rarely do you come across a community organizer, and that's who we have to. Today, we have Lyra Chubb with us. Hi. <laughs> yes, and and uh, well, that's just way more of an intro than I give anybody else. I typically don't research my guests because I people do that. They tell me, hey, this person's a good person to have on the show, and it's just freedom of speech and no script. Because, you know, but you, I know who you are, and hey. <laughs> so, but yeah, go ahead. Well, I just would like to thank you first, V, for letting me uh, be on your show, The Red Pill Hardcore. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to share with everybody about some of the projects and plans that I have been working on for the past two years and continuing to work with others in collaboration and alliance with and we are going forward with so much wonderful actions for parents and families and communities we want to be able to empower the people and to celebrate their accomplishments in community organization and um, advocacy for parents and families for children and for people in general because we have a society here today that is very unsupportive of the individual it's it's basically the <clears throat> those with the money have the special favors that they can get from the politicians and they they buy out the politicians and they buy out practically everybody <clears throat> and then then we have the rest of the people who are left to pick up the mess and pay other people's mortgages while they're just paying rent just to eke by and um, you know the, the communities have so deteriorated and I believe that's a big part of the issue that we are facing with our children being stolen away that the the government and, and other entities out there are deteriorating community when community is deteriorating and demoralized then we can't do anything for ourselves we begin to have too much dependence on the government and then we don't know how to 
function on our own. And this is a very troubling thing for people in the 21st century here. And so I have done a lot of work over the past two years um, as a result of losing my own children to the Department of Children and Family Services. And uh, they discriminated against me for my disabilities. I was in a traumatic uh, brain injury accident when I was 11 years old. And um, then I have been in a few other accidents, car accidents that left me with some physical and mental disabilities that I continue to deal with on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately for me, because I am so, um, I'm, I'm an optimist and I, and I used to be like an eternal optimist and believe that everybody is here for the right reasons to want to help other people. And so that was my whole mission is, well, I'm here to help and I want to well, make well, sure that I, everybody's. I could say, you know, they say sometimes it takes a good knock on the noggin for people <laughs> to do things the right way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in my experience, that's very well true. <laughs> so I, I commend you for, for that thus far. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and my first thing, my first plan is to help parents and families stay together to um, support reunification of families and give more services. You know, there are services that are in law supposed to be available for parents with disabilities who are involved in CPS cases. Unfortunately for parents with disabilities, the funds do not get allocated to that part of advocacy in CPS cases, okay? So we don't have enough people able to advocate for our parents who are involved in CPS cases, and therefore CPS can run, run right over parents with disabilities because they can't defend themselves. Their public defender or pretender, as we often call them, um, just has no idea how to defend a parent with disabilities. Also, a lot of parents become disabled uh, even more when their children are ripped from their arms, like I did when I was I asked for help. I asked the Department of Children and Families for help. I needed help with housing. I needed help with moving out. You know, I have three kids and one of them was six months old. And so it was not realistic for me to be able to accomplish everything that they wanted me to accomplish without them providing some assistance. And their standard answer to that was, we don't have enough services available to assist you. So that's one of the big things that the Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families is working on is, is um, creating a program and finding the programs for education of advocates to get involved with parents with disabilities and other parents as well and families. <clears throat> well, you know, you said something there that really uh, disturbs me. They don't have enough... Well, say that again? They don't have the advocates for parents and families in CPS, but, but involved in CPS cases. They don't have they, enough services. They don't no. have enough services. They don't have enough people and services. Why? Why? Because they have put their money into the adoptive placement of children. I was just about to get into that. <laughs> they if the make state three thousand dollars a day to yeah. uh, to kidnap and take care of a child, I think they can spend uh, that a thousand towards a month's worth of services to a parent. Well, they should be spending more. I mean, this is all again going back to looking at the destruction of our humanity and our communities and how the families and the children that are most vulnerable are the ones that are being targeted first so that those parents and families can't aspire to anything greater because they are challenged with just trying to make things back to normal, as normal as possible, 
and bring their children back. And when they are continually let down and told that they have to do more services, like I was, I was told, oh, you have to go in for more of this service, more parenting classes. I took three different parenting classes two times, and they still wouldn't give me my children back. I have disabilities, so I have certain medications that I have to take on a regular basis to keep my condition stabilized, and they were using that against me. They said, well, you have to stop taking that medication because it's a narcotic, quote unquote, despite the fact that this is a doctor prescribed medication that is needed for my condition to remain stable. And so again, here we don't have anybody with experience with parents with disabilities and the rights of parents with disabilities being able to be right there with these parents, including myself, saying, now this is illegal. You can't do this to this parent. This parent has disabilities that are recognized by the doctors, recognized by the state, and recognized by the federal government, and you cannot use these as a reason to keep the children away from their parents. You have to provide reasonable accommodations to these parents with disabilities. You have to provide in-home care assistance. These are things that are supposed to happen. It says in law that CPS has to provide these services before they come to a point of removing a child or children from a household. They don't do that regularly, routinely. They do not do that. And the, the, the problem is that most parents don't even know that they have the right to request these services, this assistance. There are rights. People have rights. And, and I know that having a disability gives you extra rights. I mean, there's disability acts out there. Uh, but, you know, there, there, there's so much out there that uh, there's, there's supposed to be laws that protect people who are at a disadvantage in any situation. Now, I think that this whole catch two and two with what you're going through with, with the medication and, and then keeping the kids away. And I've covered this on Family Case Files. I'm not sure if you've seen the three episodes that we have out right now, but we we actually got into this a little bit and it seems like the catch two and two is put there on purpose to, to give them absolute scrutiny, absolute power in that situation to either be able to deny or, or make it okay. <laughs> I mean, what do you think about that? I think that there are laws put in the state <clears throat> in each state, which clump people with disabilities, with people who are addicts and um, uh, alcoholics. So what happens is that they look at a situation and they, they look at their laws that are put into the state um, administrative laws. And that's what they use as their guidelines as to how to um, keep a parent from their child or keep the child from the parent. These laws, however, are against the federal um, ADA regulations on parents with disabilities. This, however, is not the only issue that I wanted to address. It is a part of the problem that we are experiencing. Um, you know, so well, before I, we move on to your other parts, let me ask a quick question. We'll let you get to that. Um, do you have any experience I, I just see these things rolling around in my head. I've got to ask them as they come up. Has anyone had any issues of saying, well, the state made me go through these evaluations, told me I had a disability, I don't recognize this disability, but they, the doctor said it, they forced me on the drugs, and now they're saying because I'm on the drugs, I can't have my children. I mean... Have I have, I have heard. yes, I have. And what I would say to anybody who is being told they have to go in for a psych evaluation, which is what this is to determine whether or not you have a disability, mental disability, is to say to take it, but also get one of your own. Now, I know that this can be expensive, but it is extremely important when you take it to court because the, they, the judge actually needs two psych evaluations that correlate in order for them to determine whether or not a parent is disabled. 
So, I mean, you know, that, and if you have a different uh, diagnosis coming from your own psychiatrist who's done an evaluation of you, then that they, they can't put it in. And you can even go to court and say that the, their um, psych evaluation is not admissible until there are two, because there needs to be two for it to be actually determined that you have that disability. Okay. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, you had uh, no, a few okay. other things you want to uh, talk about. So please, please do it. Sure. Well, so, you know, we talk about the parents with disabilities and the lack of advocacy there. There's also a lack of advocacy just for parents and for families before they even get involved in CPS cases. We have a lack of like community involvement and uh, you know compassion towards one another and, and and being able to recognize when a family is struggling we have a whole bunch of families that are being displaced all over the world right now and, and across the united states where i live from environmental factors okay where do they go well they go out on the street what happens when they go out on the street well usually cps comes by and says you aren't keeping care of your child you're neglecting them so we're going to take them off your hands okay but that's not that's not reason enough okay that is that is illegal for them to do that what they need to be doing is going into these situations seeing that these families are struggling to get housing and provide the housing for the family that would be so much cheaper and so much more efficient use of our resources than what is happening now and so that you know that's another um issue that I bring up and then I'm going to present the Family Rights Party here in the state of California. I am the secretary of the Family Rights Party and we are talking to legislators and politicians about legislation that will provide assistance to these families and we uh, encourage people all over the country to register the Family Rights Party in your state and join us. We have a site familyrightsparty.com that you can go to and learn more about how to register in your state. It's at the top of the Family Rights Party. Uh, so this is the Family Rights Party website, familyrightsparty.com. There's a free tutorial to learn how to register the Family Rights Party in your state. It's really an easy process. It costs around $25 and you are registered with the state secretary's office. You need to have at least, well, four people, four, three or four people on your board. You have to have a, a secretary, a treasurer, a chairman, and a president. And then you can have other um, members join as well. We have a vision and mission statement. It's a general purpose committee, the Family Rights Party. So what we do is we look at uh, whether or not we're going to endorse and support candidates or measures voted in different elections. Family rights are fundamental rights and all families deserve the right to fair and equal treatment in all judicial, legislative, and community environments. That's our our focus here and our mission here is the Family Rights Party is a political committee that is focused on supporting laws and candidates that ensure priorities on parents and families fundamental rights and values and we are looking to join uh, with other political parties within the United States that uh, also have the same mission in mind and that's why you're on the show because, well, we're making you uh, a director on Family Case Files TV show oh to my. help do just that, um, and also a guest co-host, so you can help me sort through these cases with your overwhelming experience, and um, let's see if we can do something for, for our current situation here, for our family rights. Sounds so, great. I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> the the arms all on this side of the table. Oh. So trust me. <laughs> uh, there are Mia projects that are blooming and, and everything's gonna umbrella everything else, but you know, you have our hundred percent support for awesome. there are all the organizations that you gather. We Officially, be their media. 
if they would like to utilize us and speak out. This is what we're here for. So um, I, I want to get into what got you into this, a little bit about your past, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so I was a victim of domestic violence. And my children and I did not have a place to flee to. And I called the police and the father of my youngest son got arrested and I was approached by CPS two days later for an interview. They did not have any warrant, but I was so much in shock and confusion and distress that I did not know how to speak up for my rights and to demand my counsel. That's what parents, you know, need to know is you can demand a counsel in your on your defense, an advocate, somebody who's going to be there to look out that to see that your rights are not violated by this group of people. That isn't exactly an agency and isn't exactly a department and in some states is a private organization. So, you know, that sure. that was what started it and then it just blossomed into an insanity that I did not know how to get out of it. I felt like I was drowning in all of the accusations that came out. I was accused of, well, you must have said something for him to get violent against you. There is, you know, that that's something that victims of domestic violence experience a lot when they come out and say, I was, I was abused. Well, you must have said something. That is no excuse. There is no excuse for abuse. And, you know, for the these people to put some blame on me for being assaulted by a six foot two man and I am five two and disabled. How is that, you know, this is something that a lot of victims experience. And so there's well, a lot that goes um, what what state were you living in when this happened? California. California is also a no runaway state. So any child that runs away from even a foster home does not have to be registered as a runaway. So there's an underground here in the state of California of runaways children that have had children and they have their own community that is totally independent. Um, but again, this has to do with a lack of community involvement, a lack of anybody caring enough to recognize that we have some serious issues here and our families are being destroyed and that it's being encouraged um, and so well, I, I want to go back that, that is <sighs> I lived in California for quite some time and there was some uh... California is a very different place to be in um, I can tell you that yeah, it, it, California, if you get cancer, for example, they have a statute now, or, or uh, um, I'm not quite sure what you call law, but you can only get two forms of treatment, and that is surgery or chemo. You try to go holistic or, eat, or try to leave the state to go get the kind of, of health care, you'll get arrested. They'll revoke your insurance. They'll, they'll, they'll do some, something. California is the most twisted place I, I've ever had the, the pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. Oh, so yeah, <laughs> I don't doubt anything you said. <laughs> I, I wanted to just address that in the in what um, the Family Rights Party is addressing is not just about family rights as fundamental rights, but about community and people and about the laws that affect everybody in a community because communities are groups of families and we need to be looking at these communities more like their groups of families instead of looking at them as individual people. I mean, yeah, we recognize individual people, but then it becomes a mess. You know, if we don't associate, well, this child is that, ch that 
person's child or, you know, this is the family, this is the lineage. We aren't, te we aren't able to teach our children the history of their lineage when we don't have them in our household. This destroys their understanding of their past and it destroys their ability to um, have the emotional attachment to the family that they're in. I mean, we have so many disparities in our society and working well, with... <laughs> I, I, I can second what you're saying. Um, that's, how, that's how they treat uh, uh, slaves in, in the U.S. That's, don't, don't teach the past, the history, the language. I mean, the, the, the family names aren't passed along. You, there's a disconnection. At that point, you're just a piece of property that can be moved around by your owner. Right. Exactly. Right. So I, I think it's – people want to say that, you know, our past, you know, we, we learn from, from the past, you know, slavery will never happen again. Oh, that, that, it's America, you know, we're land free now. We, we got through all that. It's never happening again. But it's happening. Yeah, if only that were true, right? <laughs> it's happening on a level that is extremely perverse as it is pervasive. And but 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 it's happening. So exactly what you just described was happening to the black slaves in early American history. So with that said, we're looking at an issue of not just fighting for our rights, not just getting laws changed, but we need to change the mindset of society altogether. Yes. And we've got to bring that awareness to society that this sort of stuff is going on. I mean, do you, do you have any stats or, or any guesstimation figures of like how many people in, in, in the U.S. have to even deal with CPS or, 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 or anything like that? Okay, so the the number that you should hold on to here is that over a hundred thousand children a year are in foster care. Okay, and that means that over a hundred thousand families are affected a year. Okay, now only a few percentage of those families get reunified. We're talking five, maybe 10, maybe 15% in some states where the children are being reunified with their biological parents. The rest of them are being either kept in permanent foster care because they're too old to adopt out or they are being adopted out and sometimes re-adopted out because the family they're adopted into does not want them anymore. This is the true tragedy in the United States of America. And there is always, you know, these news and media is covering with children at the border being separated from their parents. And one wonders when we have only maybe a little over 2,000 families affected with the border's separation, why this has not come into the facts that are at hand in our own country and the, the issues that we are dealing with on a daily basis. I mean, that's, if you were to say over 10 years, 100,000 families in 10 years, that's over a million families, a million families in 10 years. $500 million was taken from Title Force D and E funding for, oh no, it's just E, I apologize. Title E, uh, Title Four, Section E, um, $500 million in a 10 year period from 2007, no, 2005 to 2014 was appropriated to adoptive placement, to foster care, to all of the programs that the government now has to put in place for the different classes and stuff, okay? This is Social Security money, okay? This is, this is retirement money. This is our children's retirement money that is now being spent on their removal from their own biological family. 
So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of numbers, but those are the big ones that I can think of right now. Well, I can tell you, I've talked to lawyers, numbers you just gave are modest. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, well, you, you were just talking about certain parts of it, a certain uh, uh, title section. Okay, Title IV, Section E, funding. Oh, it's section. adoptive okay. placement. This is a part of the adoptive placement, adoptive incentive. Mm -hmm. So it okay, was so an that's incentive. a small part of it. Okay, so. Yes, it's just a small part. Oh, boy. Yeah. And Social Security funds. I mean, I mean, don't, don't get me started on, on probate. <laughs> court uh, <laughs> uh joanne if she were on the show right now she would definitely that's, don't mention the probate but yeah uh that's all coming out of social security yeah so why does I, I i really don't think the government should be drawing out of social security retirement funds for for this 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 seems entirely wrong it's not what it's there for not right. what was created you know, it's there for disabled people, people who've worked. And, I mean, if it's really going to be something like that, I mean, is there a way to be able to get the people more involved in the law? Is, is your organization going to have a way for people to say, hey, we just learned about this. We have something to say about this. We want this to change. Good question. Thank you, V. Um, so what I would like to say on that is there's a couple of different areas of focus that the Family Rights Party is going to be um, zeroing in on uh, education for family rights and, and providing information on the law in their favor and in, in parents' favor, whether it be in divorce court or probate court or CPS juvenile court, you know, all of the all of this is about educating the people about their rights and how to um, uphold their rights in a court of law. The, uh, the issue is most definitely larger than just the, the CPS cases and the juvenile court cases and even the custody cases. Uh, it's about where the money is being directed whether or not the money is helping to support the community or it's helping to support the special interest groups. And it is up to every citizen in the United States of America to get involved. And you can get involved by um, going to events, uh, even hosting your own events. We are working to put together several um, plans that we can share with people so that they can take the information and host their own event. Um, I encourage any event to be with music because music draws people in. And we have people who are very interested in music and, and I've been creating multiple teams for multiple projects. So I have an event coordination team that I'm working with. And this is the great works the great works that we're all doing here. And if we can connect and, and, and um, okay, the word is, I apologize, collaborate, that's the word, together. And we need to, I mean, there's some things that we need to do as individuals and that it requires we become more um, mature in our dealing with negative responses and negative um, comments that may be circulating that need to be more people need to be more mature when they feel hurt that they can express how they feel without hurting somebody else you know, and, and then we can actually look at what the real issue here is. The real issues here 
are about supporting and protecting our families, about providing the education that young families need and are not getting in the education system at this time, to take care of their children, to be responsible for their own income, to be responsible to take care of their needs and their wants, and to be able to decide whether or not to have a child in this day and age. I mean, these things should be educated and taught to teens and preteens in school, not what is being taught right now, which is sex education in our elementary school. That is the worst idea in the world, in my opinion. <laughs> and well, when they're teaching sex education in the schools, they're just exaggerating the issue and uh, instilling the social relationship problems earlier on in life. I think. Mommy yeah. and daddy's acting this way right now. Ooh, sex education. And it's just like, it's like <laughs> Disney wanting to have uh, people have children at a younger age. Well, you got more clientele. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like that, that way. Um, and and the little nuances there, and people, you just got to realize this stuff. It's there. And so, yeah, I definitely agree. There should be... I've gotten rants about this. There needs to be law education in general. Mm -hmm. High school. That should be mostly what high school is, is law education. Life skills. Life skills, too. Law and life skills. Correct. Because when you get out of high school, when we get out of school in general... What do you have to deal with every day? Not math, not geography. You, you don't have to write any poems. What you do have to deal with every day that you wake up is the law. Your behavior and the, the letter of the law that's on top of you, which they say, you know, not knowing the law, there's no excuse for not knowing the law, but yet it's not taught to us. And another trap. So yeah, I, I definitely, you, you preach to the choir here on that one. <laughs> we definitely need to get education about the law. And so uh, this is, this is really wonderful that, that we finally got you on the show. I know we've been scouting you out for some time and we're just very impressed with your work. And, and you have come so far, and, and I, I know the pain that you're going through, because uh, you still don't have your children, correct? That's correct. I am still fighting for my children, and the last um, thing I did was send a request for administrative review to the state Supreme Court, which is how you're supposed to go. So I followed procedure. And, and after I did the appeal and was denied, I went to the state Supreme Court, and they flatly denied me. They didn't even give a reason. I made sure that I had everything in multiple copies. I think it was 10 copies of every document that I wanted to present to the court. The, this is a um, group of justices that sit and read this stuff. So it's not just one just judge that's looking at this. And that's why they want all these copies to be made but it, I didn't get anything except for a flat denial and I have been since then investigating the best way to go about dealing with the corruption in my county in CPS and the judicial system in the juvenile court system and that's that's led me to write letters to the Department of Justice here in the county and at the state level as well and I have called and contacted the Department of Justice in the state and they told me that they closed it and i'm like what how can you close it i'm tr straight showing you here that this is discrimination and against this, the federal ada regulations and you're saying there's nothing that we can investigate here and you're closing it how is that the job of the department of justice i mean how is that doing your job honestly <sighs> I thought you were supposed to be upholding the law, right? Investigating the violators. One would think. <laughs> right? Well, these people tell us everything. Uh, for example, 
uh, criminal courts. I, I love the term criminal courts <laughs> because <laughs> the criminals are running the courts. And then there is the Department of Justice. In other words, you can say the, the, the parting of justice. There's mm. no justice for anybody. It's just a revenue factory. It's, it's a revenue generator and human trafficking. There's no justice involved. It's the department, departing, leaving of the justice. But we deal with all these Freemason and, uh, you know, wording, the law. They just laugh at us and they do whatever the hell they want. But that needs to change. I'm yes. sorry. I didn't mean to go all uh, <laughs> Alex Jones on you there. <laughs> well, it says the Red Bull Heart. That's right. <laughs> so I, it's all conspiracy theory there, but it's, it's the truth. Everything is conspiratorial, and we need to remove the conspiracy and start putting the letter of the law back into its rightful place. Yes. In a working, functional society that operates off of freedom uh, and, and justice. Freedom and justice, yes. And, you know, this is this is about changing the narrative because we have been stuck in a narrative for thousands of years, honestly. This is not a new narrative. Napoleon did the same thing to the people that he was trying to conquer, and he conquered them by taking their children away. Um, and this has gone on throughout history in many forms. And this is just the new form that it has taken. And this is the privileged taking advantage of the poor and the weak and the lost, I guess they would consider us. So it is time for us to find our place, stand our ground, and get out there and get our rights back because we have rights that we still can maintain and we can still pursue litigation against those who have wronged us and violated our civil rights. And that's why, you know, I push the Family Rights Party a lot is because that is a vehicle with which we can do this, where are the, the ideals and the policies of ethical conduct and um, our mission is about families and about being civil with one another. And about, you know, being community minded, not being single minded. This is this is how we can start changing that narrative and working and providing the services that are needed that the government isn't providing, even though they're mandated. So we can start filling in these empty spaces and then looking to ally with those individuals that may be caught up in the government system, not knowing what's really going on. And if they are just turned with enough information, then we have that much more support behind us. Absolutely. And so I'm planning on actually going across the country, um, talking to uh -huh. people this summer and, and really? helping people to get involved in their communities to create support groups locally. We encourage everybody to create a support group, whether it's, it's with uh, juvenile court cases or with parents with disabilities or, you know, there's a myriad of support groups that we want you to be looking into either creating or participating in in your community and start speaking out. Start talking hey. to people. Start speaking now. Uh, anonymous, ex uh, <laughs> op expose. Whatever state you're in, time to hop in on this. Let's do it. So, uh, <laughs> oh wow, I, I'm very excited about this. I want to thank you for coming on to the show, Lyra Jump. You are one and I guess a billion so far. Oh. You don't have anybody fighting to this level that's been in your situation to this level and wants to do what you want to do but we need that and we're going to look after you and we're going to see you all the way through your journey okay thank you you're awesome V <laughs> oh, thank you and yes this has been another episode of the Red Bull Hardcore TV show 
I'm Bill Zvi. Catch me next time. Thank you.